Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. Everything that you and I experience in life is connected to somebody, whether you like it or not. Someone is connected with your divine destination. And, and, and we have to uh, take the word. The last few weeks we've been talking about friends and, and, and how do you choose wisely. When the scripture says choose your friends wisely, it, it wasn't because he's just trying to keep your moral compass in, in order and, and right standing before him. But God knows that he has divine people that are connected to the, the divine plan and purpose that God has for your life. And, and so many times we, we tend to just invite a whole bunch of friends in our life by default and not by design. God has specifically designed people that are to be a part of your life. And, and, and I know that we've been talking a lot about this. Last weekend we had a, a panel, but I want to talk to you a little bit about my challenge because back in 2012, I hit this, this, this really tough place and it had to do with relationships. And uh, I'll tell you the three toughest jobs, and you can look this up, Google it if you want, Wikipedia, what, I don't know. But if you look it up, the three toughest jobs on the earth is President of the United States, being a physician, a doctor, and being a pastor. And the reason being is because those type of people are always put on pedestals. I mean, who wants their doctor to forget uh, or, or, or to have them forget and leave a device inside your body, right? Nobody, right? You'd be really ticked off, right? So they, they, the one moment they do something you don't like, you get upset. Our president, for example, many people at first were like cheering him on, and then he does things that nobody likes, and then they kick him off the pedestal. And I get it. Same thing goes with pastor. You know, you love your pastor until he tells you what you don't want to hear, and then you get upset, you get mad, and you leave the church. It's, it's a challenging because a lot of people enter your life, set a false expectation on you, and the moment you don't meet it they exit your life and so it's a very rejected position and platform that that God gives but it's possible because we, even within all the stuff that we all go through in life God still has divine connections for you that will get you to a divine destination that he has for you amen and so all great things flow through friendships say that with me all great things flow through friendships but all hell things also flow through friendships too, right? When God wants to bless you, what does he do? Who does he send you? People. When Satan wants to curse you, who does he send you? People. So people are influenced for good and people are influenced for evil. And so when the enemy wants to mess you up, he'll send someone to you. When God wants to bless you, he'll send someone to you as well. But I, I, I hope and pray in these last three weeks, like uh, Blair said, one thing that we, we taught about was we need to learn how to think about what we think. In other words, we got to think a little bit more profound than just coming to church, hearing a message on friends, and then we, we do nothing about it. For example, if, if, if you were to take an assessment of your life right now, and if you were to ask yourself, um, I wonder where I'm going to be two to five years from now. Well, that should be an easy response. It should be an easy answer. Here would be the answer. Okay, well, what friends are you spending time with? Because... Who you keep in the next two years or five years is what you end up becoming. So think about it. If you, if you want to grow in your spiritual walk, if you want to grow in your economy, if you want to grow in, in, in whatever capacity you're looking to grow in, you're going to have to start being intentional on finding people that have what you desire. So, yes, in the last, you know, 22 years of walking with Jesus, I had a quantity amount of friends, a lot of friends coming in and out, in and out. But now, as I'm getting older, I'm coming down to a group of quality of friends. So I'm going from quantity to quality of friends. Why? Because there are specific people that are connected to the next season of my life, and I have to start intentionally choosing those kind of people that I need to get me to the next level I need to get to. And so if you want to see the reality of the next two to five years, you're going to have to look at the people that are Take a friend inventory of who you have in your life right now and ask yourself, are these people going to help me get to my final destination? Is that... Is that should you feel like, man, that's, that, that, that sounds selfish? No, it sounds wise. The Bible says choose your friends wisely. If you start hanging out with people of excellence, what do you think is going to happen to you? 
become excellent. Come on, you start hanging out with, like, Pastor Fabi, this girl can dress up. If you want any dress skills, right here, hang out with Pastor Fabi. She is, like, first class. For example, the friend I brought in on Thursday, he is, uh, he speaks to, like, 500,000 business people every seven days a week uh, through video camera. And, but, man, that dude dresses fly. So now, like, as I've been hanging with him, I went to go speak at his business person's meeting, and it was awesome. But I had a step of my game. When I got there, I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, I'm so casual. I'm so rel- I like casual, relaxed. But the, 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 every time he, I, he and I come together, I always put on the nicest shoes, the nicest shirts. And you know why? Because when, my, when I'm around him, my level of excellence of how I dress goes up. Above. It goes up above. Why? You're hanging around people like that. If you hang around with kind people, what are you going to be? If you hang around generous people, what are you going to be? If they're always wanting to pay for your meal, aren't you eventually going to be like, dang, I better start paying up, do something, man, be a blessing to this guy. You know, or this girl always paying for me, I better pay up for something. It inspires. So whoever you're spending your time with is what you're becoming right now. If you're hanging out with people that are, that are um, procrastinators, what are you going to be? If you're hanging out with people that have no motivation, what are you going to be? No, not motivated. If you're hanging out with people that are chickens, what are you going to be? A chicken, right? Eagles soar, chickens flock. You got to think about who am I going to start connecting with? You know what? How about your spiritual walk? You know, some of you, 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 you love Jesus. You genuinely love God, but it hasn't gone beyond I love you, God. God wants to take... God has a divine connection. Like Friday, we had reveal. There are divine people in here that want to just take you on this journey, on this mountain hike of taking you to the next spiritual realm of your spiritual growth. For what? For what reason? So that you can start learning how to ride God's spiritual bike without training wheels. You need people like that in your life. So who you spend your time with is what you end up becoming. Let me give you a, a verse here. Look at 1 Corinthians 15.33 quickly. It says, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts what? And isn't that the truth? Bad company. It corrupts good character. I have learned in the last eight years of doing Elevate Church here, whenever we have a problem or or the, the leadership or the staff say, hey, pastor, we have a problem with this leader or this volunteer, and they start breaking down the issue, and I'm like, dang, what happened to them? Like, she wasn't like that. He wasn't like, man, when they first started out, man, they were like gun ho They were for you, not against you. Man, they'll do anything. But all of a sudden, you know what? They have this attitude, this spirit of division, this spirit of, of you know, I don't care, this, this spirit of, of whatever you want to call it. But you know what? And, and you can talk to our staff. The first question I always ask is this. When someone comes to me about somebody, I always ask this. Who have they been spending time with? In the church. <laughs> and you know why? Because you can, you can trace back someone's attitude by the people they're associating with. Right now, if you've had a negative attitude, that's probably because you've been hanging around with negative people. If you've been finding yourself gossiping a lot, that's probably because you're surrounded by gossipers. If you've been a lot more generous, a lot more happy, that's probably because you've been hanging out with happy people. And so it does. And so do not be misled. Bad company. Bad company. Everybody say bad company. company. It corrupts good morals. It corrupts good character, godly character. And so when people all of a sudden, they start changing, they get fun. You can trace it back to somebody. They've been hanging with somebody. They've been chilling with somebody. I know you're probably thinking about that person right now. And they're sitting next to you. (laughs) Everybody say selective. You got to be selective, guys. And, and I know that when you hear messages like this, it can, it can go to, is it can be like, wow, man, that just sounds so selfish. Like, you're just thinking about yourself. Well, you know what? Guess what? The days are short. The days are critical. And there's no time to waste. You got to be very selective and stop being that person that by default, you just start inviting as many friends as you want. You get all caught up on the quantity, especially you young people. Quantity, quantity, quantity. No, Get this revelation now. Quality, quality, quality. Don't be like me at 42, almost 43 next month, October 20th, my birthday. Make sure you bring a gift. Okay. Uh, don't get so caught up. When you start getting older, you finally like, boom, I got this revelation now. I'm like, I wish somebody would have told me this when I was 22, 25, 
30 years old, 35 years old. I wish somebody would have told me when I first started to elevate church, it probably would have saved me two years of heartache, of just feeling like I'm a reject, feeling like, like nobody wants me, nobody cares about me, nobody. But you know what? That's, we all hit that place. We all hit that place where you feel like, man, I'm just being pushed back. But in this time, we have to be around people that are going to inspire us, motivate us, make you better. And if you're not finding those people, that's because you're isolating yourself and you don't want to hang out with anybody. You don't want anyone to come into your life and inspire you, motivate you, make you better, uh, encourage you. And so here's what happened. In 2012, when I hit that low place in my life, um, I remember I got invited to, um, to a conference. And it was uh, this, this small preacher guy. He's like somewhere from the south. His name is T.D. Jakes. I'm small. You probably don't even ever heard of him. <laughs> so I'm with this small preacher guy named T.D. Jakes. And so I'm at this conference. I get invited. He's awesome. I love that guy. Man, you ever want to get motivated, just go listen to a T.D. Jakes uh, sermon. Tell you, he'll lift you up like nobody's business. Um, I go to the conference. I'm sitting there, and I feel like this whole pastoral thing. Number one, I didn't want to be a pastor. I didn't want to have a church. I wanted to do what I was doing. That was fine. I have been running for ministry since the age of like probably 23 years old. I didn't want anything to do with that. It just wasn't my passion. It wasn't my dream. I had other plans. You know what? I loved business. I loved law enforcement. I can do any of that. I was favored everywhere I went. But then God calls me to ministry. And so doing ministry became very challenging because you know what? You didn't want it to begin with, but it was God's divine plan. And so out of obedience, you start obeying God, even though you don't want it. But then you're like, but I want to obey him. And I hit this place where People were walking into my life, walking out of my life, walking into my life, and I couldn't understand it. And being at this conference, it was the perfect time, and I want to share with you what set me free and what helped me. Like today, I don't want to tell you that it's easy, but now doing, being a pastor and doing pastor is doable in the sense of now I know what to do. You guys ready to get that revelation? Okay, so 2012, I'm sitting here at the conference. I'm struggling with this issue of people walking in, walking out, walking in, walking out. And, you know, you invest so much in people, and sometimes you feel like, dang, I feel like I get robbed all the time. You ever feel robbed by relationships? Yeah, you're just like, man, I, put it, I do all the investment, but I get nothing back. And so I'm sitting there, and, uh, and T.D. Jakes says this, this to me. He says, there are three types of people you will interact with in this life. Oh, when I heard that, I just sat up on my chair. I'm like, oh, yeah, bring it. Yeah. What are these people? <laughs> and he said, the first type of person that's going to walk into your life or people that are going to interact with you in this life are confidants. Everybody say confidants. Okay, listen. Confidants are people that are very few in this life. If you have one confidant, you are doing good. If you have three confidants, you are super blessed. But confidant are those people in your life that love you unconditionally. That means that, man, you can be the most ugliest person you can be in a season where man you just you don't want nothing to do with God or or you're just acting like a knucklehead and they just man they are your confidant they're always just just loving you like no it's it's okay and and just pouring it out you see when you're a confidant or when a confidant comes into your life these are people that are for you and they are also with you they're not only for you they're with you And when you have people in your life that are not only for you and with you, that makes it extra special because you can can even be in a very bad place in life. Let's say you got into trouble and it was your fault. Man, a confidant will be with you and get in trouble with you. And they'll go down there to the very bottom of your trouble and they'll be like, that's okay. You know what? But, but don't, get it, don't get it twisted. Don't, don't be misled. They'll also call you on stuff. They'll confront you. They'll get in your face. They'll get in your business and say, what in the heck are you doing? What is wrong with you? I love you, but come on. You got to come out of this place and they will be all up in your grill because they're your confidant. They're with you and they're for you and they're not going to leave you. It's like I preached last week or the week before. I said, there are three types of friends we have in life. There are people that are in your life for a reason. There are people in your life for a season. And then there are people in your life for a lifetime. When you look at Vanessa and Angela and now uh, Trisha, the three trio, it looks like they've known each other since they were 12 years old. That's 
friendship for a lifetime. Man, I can't even be the guy that says, I can't wait to go visit my neighborhood and see my old friends. They're all dead or in prison. They've just got no friends. Anybody have any friends from back in elementary or junior high? That's, that's a rarity, man. You're blessed. But when it's a confidant, these are people that will stand with you at your worst. When you're down, when, when, when things are falling apart, they want to be there to make sure that you fulfill God's divine plan. Remember, I'm not talking about just friends. I'm talking about kingdom friends. I'm talking about people that are divinely connected to your destination, your divine appointment that God has for you. Not just friends, because too many of us, by default, we just keep inviting friends, but it's, we're not going anywhere. We're just hanging out. There's no time to hang out. This earth is critical. This, this life is short. You can't just keep hanging out. What are you guys doing? We're going to the bar. We're going to the party. We're going to, what is that? How is that? How is that building you? How is that building the kingdom? How is that changing your life? And there has to come a time where you as a person have to come to that realization, that reality of uh, who do I have in my life? Number two, the second type of person are constituents. Constituents, here's what they are. They're not into you, they're into what you are into. They're not into you. In other words, um, they have an agenda. Constituents have an agenda. In other words, there's something about you they like, and they got to get what's inside of you inside of them. Or they like the fact that, for example, there, there have been times where people have come to Elevate Church only because we used to have a food pantry. And so they're for the cause, but they're not for you. Like, they're not for the preaching, they're not for the serving, they're not for the music, they're not for the kids. They're for the, the homelessness and, and, and the brokenness of people. And so they're, they're not necessarily with you, they're not necessarily for you, but they are for the cause of your heart. And so, obviously, we've always had a cause to reach homeless people, cause to reach prostitutes, gangbangers, cause to feed people that are hungry through food pantry, the cause of reaching kids in third world countries. That people, there are people that just, they love that cause, so they're, they're, they're constituents. And, and so, here's, here's what happens also with constituents, okay? Sometimes, we confuse a constituent with a confidant. What do I mean by that? Just because they're for the cause that you have, we start becoming so vulnerable and then we start putting this expectation on them and we just start dumping all of our life problems because I trust you. I know that I can, I can tell you everything and before you know it, the moment someone else comes in that's going to go ahead and meet their agenda that you can no longer meet, they're going to leave you and say goodbye and you're, they're gone. And the only person that stays hurt is guess who? You. Because you didn't know how to identify a constituent from a confidant. See, a confidant has to see you at your worst. You can't say, I'm best friends with someone, and they've never seen you ugly, or they've never seen you argue with them about something. A confidant, you guys can go at it, fight with each other, get angry at each other, hang up on each other, and you still come back like nothing ever happened. That's a confidant. A constituent eventually comes to a, a, a place where you can no longer fulfill their agenda and then somebody else is better, so they'll go on to the next person. That's a constituent. The third person is the comrade. The comrade is not with you. The comrade is not for you. The comrade is not even for the cause of your heart. You know what the comrade is? The comrade is pretty awesome, even though, you know, you still got to... <laughs> You know, watch the comrade, or you got to understand the comrade. The comrade is the person who is against what you're against. So in other words, I'll give it to you in this description. Um, I recently had my, my plumbing again. Like, dang, here we go again. The plumbing, everything just went crazy again. And, and so I had to call a plumber, and the plumber comes in, right? He's the comrade. Hey, man. And, and, I, and of course, I thought, I'm like, man, I'm so sick of this. Man, this thing's done this twice already. He's like, man, we're going to fix that problem. We're going we're to take care of it, man. Don't worry. And then he starts looking for it, and I'm looking with him. He's like, so where else do you have an, uh, I forgot what they call it, like the, the opener or whatever. What is it called? The clean out. Where's the clean out? I said, I have a few clean outs. I have a clean out over here. And so we're both working. Until he's against what I'm against. I don't like that I'm having an overflood of everything and all this junk is coming out, right? And so neither is he. He's like, no, we're going we're gonna to fix it. By the time I'm done with this, it's going to be fixed. I'm like, yeah. 
So he starts, he does his thing, he does his magic. We're both going against it. You know, it's like, you know, you're fighting the good fight of faith with someone, right? And they're with you at that moment when the fight is on. But the moment that everything is flowing perfectly, man, they say, all right, man, have a good day. Because obviously the plumber's not going to move in. Yeah, we, we both were against the, the backup. We were both against the, the slime. We were both against, against the, all the stuff. That, but once he's done, he's done. See, the comrade says, there's nothing else that I need to help you with here. It's time for me to move on. And they move on. And once again, we put this false expectation on comrades just because they're against what you're against. And not knowing that they're just there for a season. And sometimes out of all three, it's, you're going to have all three in your life. We're going to experience it, but we're talking about how do we choose wisely now that we have this revelation and this understanding that I can't just let anybody come into my sphere of influence. I can't just be vulnerable with anybody because that anybody may be right there for me in the moment, but once they feel like they're done and they've done whatever it is they have to do with you, they're going to exit my life. And the only one that stays hurt is you. And that's been a tough one to learn here at Elevate. But I'll tell you, having that understanding, even in my own personal life, it's a lot doable. It's not easy, but it's doable. Now you understand, like, okay, this one is a, com- is a confidant. This one is a comrade. Or this one is a constituent. I already know. I already know. That's how I, I just kind of, you size people up right away. You already know who's with you and who's for you. And you already know people that are just, hey, I'm against what you're against. You know, we, we hate that little devil too. And, and they'll fight with you for a little bit, you know. And they'll get in the trenches with you. And once the fight's over, like, hey, man, <laughs> good fight. See you later. And that's okay. Those, those people are awesome as well. But we're talking, once again, we're talking about how do we, how do we identify people who are for you, who are connected to you, who are with you, someone who is happy for you. It's amazing how many of us, too, we start expecting people to be happy for us. Like, just because God gave you a dream like Joseph. See, Joseph didn't realize that his brothers, they were just constituents. They weren't confidants. And you know what he did? He cast his pearls before what? Swine. And so many of us want everybody to be excited about it. Look at what I'm going to do. Look what I'm going to do. And you just start like, and God's going to do it. And, and they're just like, yeah, whatever. So what? And they don't celebrate you. And then all of a sudden, you know what happens to you and I? We start feeling like rejects. And you know what happens? Then you start losing your identity. Then you start losing your purpose. Then you start losing your mission. Why? Because you live on the approval of man and not realizing that God has only placed at least one to three confidants in your life. I mean, Jesus only had three. If he had three, then God's saying, that's, that's, you're doing really, you're blessed if you have three. He had Peter, James, and John. Those were his confidants. He would leave the rest out, but those three were inside the circle and he was vulnerable and he would cry and he would even tell him, why are you all falling asleep on me? He would get in there, he would rebuke Peter. You need people like that. Are those easy to find? Do they exist? Yes. And I've also noticed that the people that I thought were confidants were far away from being my confidants. The people that I thought were constituents were really my confidants. So they never look like you. They never talk like you. They may not even speak like you. But you have to identify them because God has a Jonathan for a David just like David had a Jonathan for his purpose. When David was at his worst, when Saul was pursuing him to kill him, every obstacle that David hit, you know what Jonathan did? He encouraged him. And this was Saul's son. He said, hey, listen, David, don't worry about my dad, man. Man, every time he thinks he's going to get you, I'm going to tell you exactly what to do next. Man, Jonathan was a confidant. Man, he was with him at his lowest points. When David wanted to quit, give up, Jonathan said, no, man, you got this. You're going to be God's king. You're going to be in God's throne. You're going to take your position. You're not going to quit. If it wasn't for Jonathan, David would have never stepped into his kingdom purpose. There is a Jonathan in your life that's going to help you get into your divine seed. Amen? You need that. When you think about also uh, Ruth, Ruth would have never uh, uh, married Boaz if it wasn't for uh, Naomi's 
you know, pursuit after her and always trying to, you know, get in her business. I mean, that was a confidant. She got all up in her stuff and, and, and not realizing that Ruth thought, man, she just, she, I don't know, she, might, she just wants something from me. But no, she wanted to get something to her. And if it wasn't for this woman constantly going after her, she would have never been the person that begins to take the, 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 the seat as, as Israel's leader and, and started doing some big, amazing stuff. Moses, he had an Aaron and he had an her. Remember Aaron and her? So Moses is right there. This is, this is he, he was obviously winning battles by supernatural stuff. You know, every time he would lift his arms up, man, he would get victory over the enemy. But every time he got tired and put his arms down, man, the enemy would come and take more of his men. So what did Aaron do? Aaron and her come to the side of him and they started, they realized like, man, every time he lifts his arms, we get victory. So Aaron comes, he lifts up one, one arm. Her comes, lifts up the other arm, and every time that they lifted his arms, they were getting victory. When you're tired, when you're exhausted, when you're fatigued, when you don't feel you can do anymore, there's always people that God will place in your life to lift up your arm when you can't lift it up anymore. And you will get your victory. And you will get your breakthrough, but you got to know those errands and you got to know those hers. Another one would be um, uh, the paralyzed man. Go with me to Mark chapter 2 quickly. I'm almost done. Quickly, quickly. we got to move fast. This is a great story, and it's found in, in Mark, and it's found in Matthew, um, or Luke, actually. And it's the story of the paralyzed man who had four friends. And, and just think this. Let me paint the picture. This, this man was born paralyzed. He had uh, what's called palsy. And so palsy is a very, man, it's a, it's a very painful disease. It's, it's, man, it's demonic. It really is. It's horrible. And, and so he's just laying in the same place on the same mat every single day. But there were four friends, obviously, that were confidants that constantly visited him. I mean, how do I know that? Well, why would they take their precious time on the day that Jesus shows up in town and they had enough compassion or they cared enough to go get him and bring him? And so look at the story in Mark chapter 2, verse 1 through 5. And meanwhile, uh, my, my volunteers can come up. That'd be awesome. It says, a few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. And they gathered in uh, such large numbers that there was no room left. Not even outside the door. So just think about this. So they're showing up. They got this dude on a mat. And the number, and when we talk numbers, let's just take the, the feeding of the 5,000. Okay, when Jesus drew crowds, it was never in the hundreds. It was in the thousands. So just picture this. He shows up to his town. The guys have their friend. They, many of you are probably thinking, oh, he is probably right next door. No, no, that's not the way it works. Uh, when, when I've, I've been to Israel, and I know how the communities work. I've been to uh, Bethlehem. I, I've been to Nazareth. I've been to all these places. In order to get, and that's one of the things that our, our, our guide was sharing with us, it would take anywhere from a day to three days journey to get to the next town because there was no Uber. There was no Lyft in those times. I hope you know that, right? And, uh, and so these guys obviously carried him because the scripture says they carried him just imagine they had to been carrying him for hours if not days and they're 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 having to carry this heavy body amongst four of them and they finally get to their destination and there's crowds it's so packed i mean for some of us for me, for example, if I go to Disneyland and I see a line packed, I turn around. I don't give a rip. Like, come on, but it's awesome. I don't care. I don't care how awesome it is. It ain't happening. You know, it's better be like 10 minutes or less. And that's just the way I work where I'm going to buy some kind of fun pass or whatever they call those passes. I'm always trying to find, like, what do they sell? That's what I'm buying. I'm getting in. I'm not waiting on anybody. And so, but just imagine these guys had just, they had just walked and, and have been with this guy who has been literally, he's, he's learned to coexist with his disease. He's used to, can you imagine when the four guys come up here quickly? Dario, lay down. Come on, man. Let's get you in there. Look at Dario. Come on, Dario likes this too, huh? You've been liking the ride all day, huh? Have you been telling them like, come on, boys, carry me. So think about it. All day, this is all Dario does every single day. He's already 30 plus years old in, in, in the story. So this guy, he's cool with this. 
Have you ever been in a place where you've kind of learned to coexist with sadness? And you just kind of, you just, what do you do when you get sad? What happens to you? You get sleepy. You just want to sleep. Do you want to eat? No. Do you even want to take a shower? No. Do you want to get up and go anywhere? No. Well, think about this. 30 plus years, he learned to be depressed. He learned to not only be depressed, but he learned to just accept his lot in life. This is my life. Leave me alone. But obviously, there was obviously four great friends. And these four great friends are like, nah, we're going we're gonna to take you with us. And so let's finish reading the scripture. And so it says, and the people heard that he had come and they gathered in such numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door. Check that. That's how packed it was, inside out. So they were trying to get into the house like God's house right here, but it was way too packed. And he preached the word to them. And then some men came bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. And since they could not get, uh, get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. So not only was it so many people, but then they started, they needed to start thinking, okay, how are we going to do this? I mean, these guys were not going to take no for an answer. They were like, we're going to, but I bet you this guy right here, when they first showed up at his house, do you think he wanted to go to church? Do you think he wanted to go see a Jesus? Do you think he even cared about going to see a Jesus? When you're in that condition for so long, you don't care about anything. You're just like, man, just give me my water, give me my bread, I'm good. But these guys were like, nah, today's your day. Today something supernatural is going to happen in your life. I'm sure they kept, he kept telling him, you know, just leave me alone. Just, I'm okay. Just, just let me be. And these four friends just kept, no, we're going to do it. And so the Bible says that... Um, when Jesus saw their what? So check this out. So not only do they, do they get up on a roof, but now they're committing burglary. I know that many of you, you're probably thinking, oh, they probably, it was, the roof was made of hay. And no, the roof was made of tiles. So they had to literally cut a, a hole big enough of tiles. How long, how long did that take? I mean, just think what kind of friend would do that for someone. When was the last time that you went out of your way and you sacrificed so much that you had to think for a change to say, how am I going to get this person healed? And so they remove the tile, and, and then the moment the body goes down, did, do you notice that it doesn't say, and Jesus saw the paralyzed man? Who did he see? He saw faith. And it says, and when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, friend, your sins are forgiven you. I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them saying, we have never seen anything like this. Let's, 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 let's do a pause there. This was something unusual. Think about it. This is so unusual for the paralyzed man to be like, get up, take my mat, and walk. okay, great. No, impossible. I think many times we think that, that when people come to church, and, and there is there's miracles, but we're not here praying for miracles. We're here praying for a people that have a love for lost people that want to go reach people. So think, you guys can carry him. Go ahead, carry him around real quick. Go ahead, guys. So, so, so not only did they carry him, because remember, how long, how, long, how long was the journey? One to probably three days, right? So obviously, for, for one to three days, they are carrying this dude. But do you think they were just doing this, like, all quiet, just like, okay, we're, we're almost there. No. You know what they probably did? I'm sure they did. And it has to be because it's so unusual for someone. When you have been so down, you, you don't want to believe anything. You don't. If someone tells you, you know what, you're not going to be sad. You're going to come out of this. You, when you're so down, you don't give a rip who comes to you and tells you everything's going to be all right. You know why? Because you've been that way for so long. And it doesn't matter what anybody says. You just kind of, you believe more about your condition than you believe about coming out of it. 
But check this out. Here's the difference. So these guys are walking with this brother. So I bet you that every single time that they're taking a step, I bet you they kept looking at him. And let's just say his name was Israel. And they're probably saying, Israel, man, today you're going to ride a donkey. It's going to be awesome. Hey, Israel, today, man, you are going to run with us. You are going to, we're going to do life together. Guess what, man? Hey, listen, actually, uh, um, you know, I know this guy named Peter, and, and, and even though he's serving Jesus right now, but he still has a position right now for you. Give these guys a big hand. He has a position for you. He has a position for you to work. And guess what, man? We can already see you having kids. So I bet you for, for the amount of time that they took carrying this man in his mat, they took the time to speak life over and over and over and over. And I bet he resisted, resisted. But eventually, because he had plenty of time with them, because these men probably always encouraged him, it was unusual, but not really. When Jesus said to him, get up, take up your mat, and go home, it was easy for him. Why? Because his four friends had already poured in so much life into him, it was easy to accept what Jesus was already telling him. And so many of us, we have people that we know, may not be physically paralyzed with palsy, but you know that there are people that you work with, there are family members that you do life with, there are friends that you have in your life that they are paralyzed with fear, doubt, anger, anxiety, and the only people that need to begin to be a friend is you. Because once you decide to break in for them in this house, Jesus will meet him and say, rise up, take up your bed, and walk. And then healing takes place. When those two ladies brought Trisha here, when Trisha came here, it was easy. It had nothing to do with what I did or with what God did. You know what it had everything to do with? What those two girls were willing to do in pouring life into this girl at her darkest hour. And when she came to this house, it was easy for her just to receive Christ because of the love that she saw in those four friends. Are you hearing me today? The reason I brought this illustration for you is because if you notice, there was a man on every corner. And when you want to be a confidant, you have to have four type of characteristics in you. Number one, you have to have the place of compassion. See, you're never going to reach anyone for Jesus until you develop compassion for broken and lost people. Yeah, but I do. I encourage people. Yeah, but do you ever bring them to Jesus? Because Jesus is the only healer. You can encourage people for a day, but you bring them to the Father and he'll transform their life. You can inspire people for a week, but Jesus will transform their life. You can motivate people to go hang out, but Jesus will transform them for a lifetime. And so you got to have compassion. So the first guy who lifted up, it was compassion. Compassion said, let's go get our friend. But the second guy was as important as compassion because once you have compassion, you're going to need faith. Everybody say faith. Jesus said when he, when he looked up, he saw their faith. You see, Matthew 9, 29 says, it says, uh, according to your faith, be it unto you. This guy, faith, was like, man, compassion already came in. I got faith. You're going you're gonna to get up off this bed today. You're coming out. And, of course, man, that built his faith, built up compassion. But then this guy over here, the third guy, was determination. Because you know what? If you're going to reach people in this dying, broken, and lost world, and when you see the crowds like they did, they saw crowds. There's no way in. There's no way we're going to be able to get this guy inside. But determination and the will in a man or woman, man, will trump whatever obstacles in front of you. You have to be determined. I'm going to see this person come to Jesus. I'm going to see this person receive their healing. I'm going to see this person get restored. I'm determined to see it happen. And so many of us, when people push back, we just give up on them. We just quit on them. Now, I get it. There's some people that it's going to take someone other than you. But that doesn't mean that you stop being determined. And then the last person at the other corner is love. See, you can have all the compassion, you can have all the faith, and you can have all the determination, the determination but love covers a multitude of sins. Love is the driving force that compels you to do all three. You need the unconditional love of God to be able to look at ugly people, 
hurting people, hateful people, and love overcome that, and you reach them. If today's message impacted you in any way, and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below, and we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.